For this scenario, I want to consider this sort of a coupled motion device called a half Atwood machine. It's half Atwood because the full one would also have not just one, but two of these hanging masses, one on the opposite side pulling the other way, but this is enough for now to get some of the basics of what we would like to try to do with this sort of setup. So what we have here is we have one hanging mass sitting right here, not touching anything, connected with a string going over a, an ideal pulley to another mass that's sitting on a table here. So we could imagine that if this thing, the hanging mass starts moving down, this mass on the table starts moving forward. For simplicity, let's assume that this is a nice frictionless system. The question is then, we wonder, okay, how fast is this thing going to move, or more correctly, how much is it going to accelerate? So we know that there's going to be the gravitational force on this guy, and there'll be tension here pulling upward. There will be gravitational force on this guy, but the normal force up, and tension forward. So we would expect then there's some sort of net force acting on this block in this positive direction, and this guy will also be moving downward than we would expect. So they should also have the same acceleration since they are connected together. So now how might we figure out, okay, how much should this system accelerate? Let's first then set up some free body diagrams and choose a coordinate system as well. So usually we would consider, for example, towards the right as being the positive direction. Now if this thing moves right, this guy is going to move down. So in that way, I'm going to say that down is the positive direction, so that way when this thing moves in the positive direction, the hanging mass moves in a positive direction. That will help simplify things. So let's consider our first mass and draw a free body diagram. So M1 will have its own weight downward, a normal force, and then the tension force here. The hanging mass, on the other hand, mass 2, will have a tension force upward and its own weight downward. Now, we have to instantly stop the instinct you might have that you might think, oh, well, the tension and the weight of mass 2 are the same. If that were true, then there would be no net force on M2, and it wouldn't accelerate ever. And that won't really be true in general. If mass 1 is starting to move to the right, because there is a net force on it, there's some net force to the right, then it's going to move forward, so this guy should move forward. So if anything, we should expect this tension force to not equal the weight. In fact, we'd expect the weight to be greater, so it can accelerate down. And again, let's specify that we're saying down is the positive direction, to the right here is the positive direction. So let's work on mass 1 and set up some equations describing its motion using Newton's second law. So we can do two sum of forces equations, one for the y direction. And since we said down is going to be positive, we have n1g minus fn. There will be no acceleration in the y direction, so this force should just sum up to 0. So I could solve for the normal force. But since we're going to deal with a frictionless system, the value of the normal force won't matter because the friction, no matter what, will just be zero. So we will just ignore that part for now. What we care about is the acceleration in the x direction. So there's only one force in the x direction, t. So that'll equal then mass 1 times the acceleration. And we can do the same thing for the other mass. For that hanging mass there, the only forces that exist are in the y direction. In fact, I should also put some labels up here that this was the forces on body 1. So when I use sum of forces here in the y direction, I should specify this is the forces on body 2 in the y direction. So again, down is positive, so we have m2g minus the tension force equals mass 2 times acceleration. Okay, so what do we have right now? We have two equations that we can play with with two unknowns in them, the tension 
and the acceleration. Well, two, uh, two unknowns, two equations, we can do some algebra and solve for that. Now, specifically, I want to solve for the acceleration. So if I solve for tension here, as I have, and plug it in to the second equation, I'll have tension in terms of acceleration, and I can solve this whole equation as acceleration. So I'm going to do just that. Take this equation and plug it in to tension. So when I do that, I'll have m2g minus m1a equals m2a. Now we just have a few steps of algebra. Give ourselves a little bit of space to complete that algebra work. So when we do that, we're going to see that we have m2g equals m1 plus m2 times a, little distributive property there, divide both sides by that sum of masses. So we'll have m2g divided by mass 1 plus mass 2 equaling the acceleration of the body. So if we look at this, there's two things we're going to notice. One is that there's really only one force that's dragging this whole thing forward, and that's the weight of the hanging mass, mass 2 here. And that mass has to pull not just its own mass downward, but also the mass on the table. So you basically have only one engine, the hanging mass, and it has to move all of this along with it. You could also, you could imagine the hanging mass as the locomotive, and then so the locomotive has to move its own mass and its, quote, fuel source or the cars, the other stuff that it's pulling along. So let's imagine a scenario right now and see if our equation ultimately here makes sense. Suppose that the mass on the table, M1, is huge in comparison to mass 2. In that case, the denominator here of this equation is so large that the acceleration here should go to zero. Well, that kind of makes sense. Basically, if you have a really tiny, um, let's say like a 50 gram mass and you're trying to pull a locomotive forward with it, it's probably not going to move very quickly. So that makes sense that if we make the mass that's just sitting there on the table huge, this isn't going to move much. On the other hand, what if M1 were very, very small in comparison to M2? So small that we could pretty much ignore it as if it weren't there. In that case, you would just have M2 times G divided by M2. In that case, the mass terms would cancel out. Again, M1, we're saying is so small it could be ignored. And the acceleration would just equal acceleration due to gravity, as if there weren't anything on the table at all. So we just did a few checks, and it makes sense that if there's a huge mass on the table, then it's barely going to get accelerated. If the hanging mass is really huge compared to the mass on the table, then the whole system just falls as if it were just in free fall. That also seems to make sense. So nice little way of checking our work to make sure that it makes some intuitive sense to us. The only caveat now we might consider is this was for an ideal case without any friction. If there were friction, um, specifically if there were friction in the uh, mass moving along the table, then we'd be, have to add some sort of a force vector, such as a friction force vector in the opposite direction of motion. If we did that, then we would have to add an additional force here in the negative direction and then solve for the tension here. And if we need to figure out what the friction force is, well then we'd probably have to solve for the normal force, and so we actually would then have to play around with this equation, find what the normal force is, plug that into friction force, and so on. So the friction just becomes a little bit of a complication. Not that big of a deal overall, it just makes the algebra a little bit more tedious. If you want to make this even further complicated, one other thing we said was that that pulley that the string goes over was ideal. So remember we had a pulley, string going over it. If we had to worry about, oh, we need to make this pulley spin around and accelerate that, shouldn't we have to worry about that? Well, that is something we might worry about in a future lab or a future homework problem.
But like I say, we'll keep it ideal for simplicity because when we change that, we end up having um, not only another mass basically to accelerate the mass of the wheel getting it to spin, but also the tension here and here on both sides won't actually be the same. But we'll save that for another fun time lecture.